I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network, and here today with me is Adrian Day, president of Adrian Day Asset Management. Thank you so much for joining me in person again. Well, thank you for having me. Great to see you, and I think we're, so we're here at the Rural Symposium, we're in Florida. I've been saying to people that this seems like a really good time to have had this conference. I don't know if it was delivered or not, but we did have the Fed meeting yesterday. We got our 75 basis point rate hike that's been well discussed. I'm sure you've been talking about yeah. it all day long on the floor. Are there any points that you would pull out that people may have missed from that, that meeting or the press conference? Well, Charlotte, unfortunately, when you're at a conference like this and you're doing them seeing and speaking and on the panel, you don't get a chance to look at the news. So I think a couple of important things that I have heard, one definitely is that uh, the Fed or Powell you know, first of all, the 75 was not surprising. Secondly, when you look at the um, co uh, the uh, release that the Fed put out, you know, there was nothing at all surprising in that. They changed two sentences, one of which said that we've observed the economy getting better. So they took that out. So that was not a surprise. And so you look at the press conference. That's where you get the uh, surprises, if you ever get any surprises. So I think a couple of important things from there. One was that Powell very studiously avoided using the word recession, denied we were in a recession, denied we were going into a recession. And that, of course, follows on from Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, last week saying, oh, you know, we used to say that we're basically changing the definition of a recession. OK, we're in a recession according to the old definition, but we're going to change the definition so we're not in a recession. Not very fair. Which, well, frankly, it's pathetic. Um, so Powell, Powell followed along with that. And Powell, Powell, like all Fed chairmen, are political. Um, they're political in different ways. You know, Greenspan just liked the glamour. So he wanted to please the bosses so that he went to all the nice parties. Um, but, but Powell, all, all of the press chairmen uh, want to follow the administration. No Fed chairman. You don't expect Powell to come out and contradict what President Biden or Janet Yellen has just said the week before. So in a way, that wasn't surprising. But I think it's very important that, that they don't, and we can draw a larger, I'm sorry, we can draw a larger lesson from this. One of the problems with the Fed, there's lots of problems with the Fed. We don't have time for that. And you haven't asked me. But one of the problems with the Fed, this Fed, is that they're data dependent. They give that as a virtue. You know, we don't have these grand plans or anything. We are dependent on the data. We'll do what the data tells us. And the problem with that is when you're data dependent, you're always looking backwards. You're looking at what is already happening, happened. So if you look at a CPI report that came out, let's say, two weeks ago, that's reflecting the CPI report from a month ago. And, and similarly, so everything they're looking at is old. So when Powell yesterday said that the jobs market is very strong, he's looking, I was going to say something rude, but let's just, he's looking at the unemployment rate. The unemployment rate is low, and there's lots of job openings. Therefore, the employment picture is strong. But a few things wrong with that. One is he's looking at old data. And as we know from listening to conference calls in the last week, the jobs, the jobs picture is going to change very, very dramatically when all these large companies, Walmart and Amazon and, and AT&T and everyone else, are either saying, they're stopping hiring or they're laying off people. So the jobs picture is going to change very, very quickly. And he's looking at old data already. And the other factor, frankly, is that the unemployment rate may be low, and it is low. But the labor participation rate has also declined. And the number of new um, unemployment claims, people being laid off or fired, laid off, has gone up. So those are more forward-looking indicators. And he's just looking at the past. So you're going to see that unemployment rate change very dramatically. Right. And so often, I think, a complaint, as you mentioned, there's many complaints you can make about the Fed. But one that we tend to hear is, you know, they start 
too late and then they go too far. Is that because they're looking at that backward data? I think that's part of it. I mean, I, I think there's a certain hubris. Let's just, let's face it, you, 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 they're mortal. They're human beings, but they've been told over and over again, you go back to Time magazine covers in the 1990s, that these are the people that can save the world, these are the smartest. Remember that famous Time or infamous Time magazine cover that had Greenspan and Bernanke and uh, someone, oh, Draghi, and Yokoto from Japan on the cover saying, you know, the men that saved the world. Well, when you're told over and over again that you're very smart, you've saved the world, and you think you can fine tune they talk about fine-tuning the economy, which, when you think about it, is preposterous. How can a group of 12 people sitting in Washington deciding monetary policy and interest rate policy, they don't have all the data available to them? You know, that is a, a key tenant of Austrian economics, if you like. Mises talked about it, Hayek talked about it. But knowledge is, is distributed, and everybody makes individual decisions in response to what happens. You can't, you can't have, basically the Fed is central planning. We don't call it central planning, but that's what it is. Anyway, to, sorry, I'm, I'm going on to tangents here, but the point is I think there's a certain hubris there. They wanted inflation at 2%, we didn't have inflation at 2%, it got up to one and a half, and they think, don't worry about it, when it gets to two, we can stop. You know, we're smart, we know what we're doing, we have the tools, remember they keep saying that? We've got the tools to deal with it. And I, I genuinely think that they believe that they can change things quickly. And they left it too late, uh, I, I, I think because, you know, they didn't see it coming. And when they, when they did see it coming, they still thought they had plenty of time to change. Right, and so we're here at this event and obviously there is a lot of, I would say, negative opinions about how far the Fed can get with its activities. But at the same time, one question I've been starting to ask people is what does the general market, general people out there think the Fed can be able to do? Because, you know, after the meeting yesterday, we saw major indexes going up. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, well, on the index, I would say that, that the market was primed for a rally. So it's, and, and you, know, you know this as well as I do, but when markets are primed either for a rally or a drop, then anything can trigger it. And sometimes the thing that triggers it logically doesn't make sense. Why did that trigger a rally or a drop? But, but, but you see that with markets, you see that with individual stocks. Um, a lot, and that's why stocks often drop when there's a, 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 a one cent miss on earnings, which is a, a, a sort of meaningless thing, but the market's ready to punish. So I think the market was ready for a rally. So I, I wouldn't read too much into the market rallying after Powell, um, after, after Powell spoke. Um, I'm sorry, what was the first part of the question? Right, <laughs> so basically, you know, we're here in this environment at this conference where everybody you know, does not have confidence that the Fed will right. get very far. But oh, the perception the, more broadly. Yeah. yeah, I think the perception more broadly is certainly more positive, more optimistic for two reasons. One is, remember, most people today were not around in the 70s. Most people today, their whole experience of the Federal Reserve, even if you were, you know, 20 years old in 1985 or 1990, your whole experience has been of the Fed put. Your whole experience has been that the Fed does a little bit and then they stop, right? And it's not just once, it's over and over and over again. And so a lot of investors and the broader public think that's what will happen again. You know, the Fed will move up a little bit and then they'll, they'll reverse. Um, I think what, what people are missing is just the enormity of, of the task right now. You know, I mean, if you look back to, uh, if, if you look at um, where we are now, we're starting from zero interest rates and we have inflation or CPI at 9.1%. That's 
completely different situation than 2017 when you had no inflation and they were trying to get inflation up, right? It's completely different from 2013 or 2008 or 2000, etc. It's completely different. You've got a huge gap between where interest rates are and where inflation is. So it's a it's a different situation. And um, but I think I think people are still thinking, oh, the Fed will do a little bit and then they'll pivot. And you only have to look uh, Monday. The New York Fed was it Friday or Monday? I can't remember. The New York Fed came out with their survey of investors' expectations for inflation, and the survey of investors' expectations for inflation went down from 3.9 next year to 3.6. Investors, on average, think inflation, CPI inflation, will be 3.6% next year, which is lower than what they thought the month before. Now, why, wh why is that? What changed? The only thing that changed is the Fed said, the Fed raised rates, and the Fed said, we're going to keep going till we beat inflation. So you can only conclude from that that most investors I believe in the Fed at the moment. Okay, I am going to go now just briefly in a different direction. I think we could talk about this for a very <laughs> long time, but our time is limited. So the other point that I wanted to bring up with you today is we had the results from Newmont earlier this week. People seemed disappointed in those. They talked a lot about how inflation is hurting basically the business right now. So I wanted to touch base with you on that and see if that's a major concern for you, if you think this is something we'll see or have seen from other major gold miners. Yeah, uh, again, I think what the reaction to Newmont, which was down like 12 or 13% at one point, um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an illustration or example of what I mentioned earlier. The market was just ready and watching. They're watching. Are, is, are their costs going to be a little worse than we thought? Yes, they are, sell. The thing about uh, Newmont right now, it's the largest mining company in the world, but really we knew more or less what was going to, what were going to be the results because Barrick had already pre-announced pre, uh, pre production and costs. So Barrick runs Nevada Goldfields, which is 50-50 Newmont Barrick. Barrick uh, uh, released Boddington, which is also a Newmont mine. What I'm saying is that half of Newmont's mines had already been pre-announced. I think what happened with Newmont is uh, they were worse than people expected, particularly on a year-to-year -year basis. They were worse than people expected, but people were primed, primed for a disappointment. So it's interesting. I think Newmont's, Newmont's so far, so far, Newmont's cost uh, issues have been worse than some of the other companies. You know, Barrick was up 2 to 3% over, over their guidance, uh, which wasn't that bad. Agnigo was, was relatively good. Um, uh, but of course, again, we're looking at second quarter, right? Which ended at the end of June. So, and, and, and it included Mar April, right? We're looking at the second quarter, April, May, June which means we don't have the, even if inflation peaked last month, we still don't have the full impact of those higher numbers yet in, in costs. That'll come in the third quarter. There's no question that, that, that inflation, the higher costs are very important to mines because number one, uh, energy is the number one, the number one cost input of running a mine and the second largest are uh, what we call the commodity currencies. Now, the commodity, even though energy is high, the commodity currencies have been low, Australian dollar, Canadian dollar, uh, Brazilian real, South African uh, rand, and so on. The places where most mines are, which is where all your local costs are, those commodity currencies have been low. What we really need to watch for is if inflation cost pressures generally generally in the economy, remain high, then you'll start to see the commodity currency, what we call the commodity currencies, you'll start to see those move up against the dollar, and then you'll have enormous cost pressures for, for the mines. Uh, you know, you only have to look at, let's say, the Australian dollar, what is it today? I don't know, 72 or something against the dollar. Back in 2011, it traded at a premium to the dollar. So there's a so the, the commodity currencies are very, very cheap right now, which means they have room to move up. 
Okay, well, I think that's what, where we'll wrap it up today. You've given us, as always, a lot to talk about, and thank you for coming by to share. Oh, well, thank you very much for having me. Of course, and once again, I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Invest in Youth Network, and this is Adrian Day. Okay. <laughs>